And this time, I'd like to invite to the podium the next presenter, Mr. Yongil Chan, head of the Statistics Research Institute. So he will be talking about the data science-based exit policy, infection cycle prediction capability, and global crisis response. Please give him a big hand. Nice to meet you all. I am the head of the Statistical Research Institute responsible for the development of statistics for Korea. And the Statistical Research Institute is working on researching innovative research, innovative statistical methodologies. And also, we are working on research to back up the development of Korea. So that uh, kind of work has been done by us over the last 14 years. Today, uh, my presentation is, as, as you see on the screen, about data science-based exit policy. Actually, please pay attention to the English title of my presentation because there are important terms and concepts in uh, the English title. Maybe the English title is a bit different from the Korean title. However, what I want to tell you is that, you know, we are, as you know, in the situation in responding to COVID-19. In this situation, it's very important to take a scientific, science-based uh, approach. Especially, making predictions is important as well. Through predictions or through, through uh, prediction modeling, we need to uh, prepare ourselves for the future situation. So if prediction modeling enables us to see elements related to the pandemic in advance, wouldn't it be helpful for us to take proactive measures? So that was the starting point for our research. So considering all this, today I want to talk about my experience uh, of um, running predictive modelings. This is a list of researchers who have been working with us. We formed the Korea-Canada Research Group, especially Professor David Fisman of the University of Toronto, has been work working with us along with the other researchers and other professors of the University of Toronto have become the members of the Korea-Canada Research Group. And with them, we have uh, been working on prediction modeling for infectious disease. And this fact is very important because uh, the experts and specialists of both nations have been working on the same subject. Today, during my presentation, I want to touch upon three major things. First, why do we need science-based policy making? Why we are uh, pursuing it will be talked about. And secondly, Database epidemic predictive modeling will be explained, and we will look back on what has been done. And at the same time, I'd like to talk about what kind of preparations we should make in order to respond in, in order to respond to the crisis. And lastly, in the post-COVID-19 situation, what kind of uh, work do we need to work on? So especially AI-based modeling will be explained. And so at the same time, we need to make preparations for creating a data economy. So these will be talked about in my presentation. There are so many um, pieces of information uh, in the presentation file. So I may skip some of the uh, things that are complicated. So I'd like to touch upon the first topic. So why should we pursue science-based policies? The evidence-based policy is one of the global trends, as you know. So it was 1997 when uh, the evidence-based policy making uh, was first introduced by British Prime Minister Tony Blair in the UK. The concept and the word was first began to be used by him, and in fact, in Korea, uh, started the introduction of evidence-based uh, policy-making process from 2007 under the Noh Mo Hyun administration. 
What about the United States? The U.S. started from 2014 um, in uh, making efforts for evidence-based uh, policy making. They formed the U.S. Base, uh, the evidence-based policy making commission to come up with necessary legislations to enable evidence-based policy making. What I personally welcomed was that actually Professor Catherine Abraham, who, you, who was my academic advisor for my doctoral thesis, served as the chairperson for the Evidence-Based Policymaking Commission of the United States. So uh, because of that, I could uh, make a partial contribution to the establishment of the evidence-based policymaking legislation for the United States. The reason why I'm telling you is that actually uh, Korea is definitely a developed country in terms of this area. Korea was a little later than the UK. However, Korea moved earlier than the United States in the effort for evidence-based policy making. It was not abrupt to talk about evidence-based policy making in Korea because for more than you know, 10 years, Korea made a preparation for evidence-based policy making. So we moved ahead where we uh, moved earlier than the United States. In order to have a better understanding of the database infectious disease uh, spread predictive modeling, I need to talk about uh, some elements. First, I want to talk about the reproduction number. And secondly, concerning the national crisis by the COVID-19, it's very important to measure or predict the future in times of uncertainty. So is it possible to make predictions in uncertainties? So uh, in order to tackle that question, I'd like to introduce to you one of the methodologies that is called IDEA. And lastly, I'd like to talk about the results of prediction modeling and how to respond to the future crisis. Having a clear understanding of the reproduction number is important because the basic understanding of the numbers will be helpful for the nations and as well as for the general public. So reproduction number is R and the uh, reproduction number is measured and uh, based on the measurement, we can come up with the necessary countermeasures for preventing and controlling the disease. But in order to measure R, we need three factors. The first factor is P, probability of infection. And second factor is C, contact propensity. So C is called contact propensity. And the third factor we need in order to come up with R is D, duration. So three factors are measured and combined and multi multiplied to have R, reproduction number. Having the basic understanding of these factors and these numbers is very important. So uh, having a clear picture of uh, these factors will help the, the general public have a better understanding of why we need a preventive and preparation or control measures like washing hands and keeping the personal hygiene discipline. So wearing masks and uh, using sanitizers are the examples of the ways to reduce P, probability infection. And when it comes to contact propensity, social distancing measures is important because, for example, the online school education, working from home, and avoiding to avoid avoiding the use of multi-purpose facilities can be the one of the measures of the social distancing. And the D, when it comes to the duration, I'd like to tell you that Korea has such a good 3T system, testing, tracing, treating. So having a good 3T system is critical for reducing the duration time. And this requires a scientific approach. For testing, we need to have test kits 
And in order to contact trace, or in order to trace contacts, we need a lot of data uh, about the uh, pathways of contacts. And when it comes to treating, and uh, we need to classify the patients or cases into mild cases, severe cases, and severely ill or critically ill cases. So uh, in terms of PCR, there are measures that we can take to bring uh, the numbers down. And this is a major content, a major point of my presentation. If you have a good idea or if you have a clear understanding of these factors, you would understand better why the government has been taking the measures that has been uh, taken so far and why uh, such measures were needed you know, for uh, our society, for our country. Like social, why social distancing is necessary will be better understood by you if you have a clear understanding of PCD and R. So measuring P, C, D, and measuring R in an accurate manner is very important because you know, based on that, those numbers and figures, we can move ahead because we can make some predictions. And these numbers will be helpful for policymakers to make preparation in advance for upcoming crisis or for upcoming events. And I really hope that uh, taking to, uh, today's opportunity, uh, the R is equal to P times C times D, uh, that equations can be understood by everyone. There are many prediction uh, methodologies available. However, you know, uh, as I mentioned, um, the Korea-Canada formed the research team together for prediction modeling. So the, one of the methodologies that we use is IDEA that stands for Incidence, Decay, and Exponential Adjustment. In fact, IDA or IDEA reflects the epidemiology-based model named SIR. S uh, stands for susceptibles. So uh, the uh, every person uh, exposed to infectious disease is susceptible. So in fact, here everyone here is susceptible to infectious diseases, and I stands for infected, and those infected with the virus. And the R stands for removed, so recovered or um, recovered re recovered cases were those who lose their lives. And based on the methodologies, we can check whether there would be an exponential growth or whether there could, would be an exponential reduction. So if R is over 1, that means that there will be an exponential growth. But if R is less than 1, we can predict that there will be an exponential reduction. So in this sense, the idea Prediction modeling was used by our research group. So this slide shows how um, support, uh, how scientific the methodology we have. So far, actually, we have carried out predicted pr pr uh, prediction modeling eight times, along with the uh, Canadian researchers. So when it comes to prediction modeling. Reducing uncertainty is important. And also based on the analysis and assessment of prediction modeling, we can um, make uh, policies that are needed for the future. Starting from early March, we have worked on predictive modeling, and this is the uh, curve of infection. And the first graph so is about making predictions for infection. So this prediction was made in early March, and according to the prediction, it was predicted that early March would hit a peak of daily confirmed cases, early April would enter the down to mood, the end of May would have confirmed cases, case numbers between 9,100 and 11,000. So that was the prediction made all in early March. And what actually happened was quite close to the projection. So the modeling that we did was quite accurate when we made a comparison between projection numbers and actual numbers. And this is more detailed information of uh, the prediction that we have come up with.
And this is the uh, projections of R numbers. So as you see here, you, know, you can check out the development of R coming from 8, which is very high number, and down to uh, less than 1. So looking at these projections and the government policymakers come, come up with, uh, can come up with the countermeasures like making decisions on you know, when to reopen school and so on. And this is the additional data concerning that. And uh, we separately looked at the prediction uh, data for Daegu and Gyeongbuk area separately as well. And uh, making predictions for across the nation uh, is done as well. But at the same time, in, uh, when, uh, in order to measure the effect of the counter uh, countermeasures or in order to predict the effects of the countermeasures, it's necessary to look at a specific area and usually, it is projected that the effects of social distancing or effects of uh, important social uh, uh, the countermeasures is felt usually two weeks after the measure. So in the middle of April, we conducted the fourth modeling. And we made predictions about R numbers regarding how the R numbers would be reduced in the coming months. And as you see here, actually the time span is from the end of February until May. And we looked at daily case numbers on a daily basis. And there are, there are many steps of social distancing, like social distancing, enhanced social distancing, and and many other um, measures. And when you see the overall pattern of actual situation, it is quite close to what we have projected. So this is a part that I always emphasize in other uh, presentations as well. We do simulations. Through the simulation, we can check a situations where we do not have any measures taken by the government and by the civil society or by the general public. And according to the simulation, the number of confirmed cases could be as many as 3.4 million. And also, the peak of the COVID-19 confirmed cases would have come much later th than now. But thanks to uh, the uh, countermeasures taken by the government, we could have controlled the COVID-19 situation. And we look at uh, the numbers and figures concerning Korea, but at the same time, we also review the numbers and figures of other countries. What about other countries, like, for example, Spain, Italy, and uh, those countries who are similar to Korea, or in some senses, they are better than us. However, in those countries, they had hundreds of thousands confirmed cases, and the number of deaths was much higher than that of Korea. So these are the developments of many countries concerning uh, new confirmed cases. So the prediction for Korea is important, but at the same time, we need to look at the global trend as well. And we cannot succeed in dealing with COVID-19 only by our efforts alone. So we need to think about the situations of other countries as well. So this shows the situations after distancing in daily life. And we still work on uh, collecting data related to 17 cities and provinces across the nation. And based on the data that we collected, we make projections. And according to the projection that we did, in the future, we will see ups and downs of infection numbers as time goes by. And this kind of pattern will be shown in a repetitive manner. And that pattern was already experienced by Seoul metropolitan area. This is a case for Seoul and Gyeonggi metropolitan area. So the peak number was like 30 or 40. But it went down again. So the, there was a first wave here uh, in the Seoul and Gyeonggi metropolitan area. These kind of small waves will 
uh, come again and again in a repetitive manner. So this is the, what what is so-called dynamic social distancing effects. So this is about you know, measuring the R number, reproduction number, to see by when the crisis will die down or to see when the crisis will subside. And this is the last part of my presentation. So through these uh, projection, uh, prediction modeling, so what kind of you know, things we need to work on in the future? So what are the next steps to take? So there are three things that I, want, I, that I want to emphasize. First of all, we need people. So we need people and quality people who are good at evidence-based policy making. And we need modelers who are able to leverage AI data in a good manner. So if we have the data designers and if we have evidence-based policy makers uh, all together, we will be better respond to any crisis in the future. And AI-based and data science-based predictive modeling is also needed. But at the end of the day, in every matter, what matters most is people. So this is my uh, the end of my presentation. So I'd like to address further questions during a Q&A session. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Director General John. While listening to the presentation, that you were able to see the responses made by the Korean government was based on the robust science and data and the data-based and the science-based modeling, how accurate it is and how right it is in developing the right measures. And in the presentation of Vice Minister Kim gang Nip, we were able to learn more about the measures taken by the Korean government as he was involved in the control tower of the Korean government. Yet there were many good measures taken, but the special and the emergency approval for the diagnostic reagent, I think that was a quite good measure taken by the Korean government. The presentation of Vice Minister Kim gang Nip was made through the video, but now we have the Vice Minister Kim gang Nip here with us, so he will be able to join us for the discussion and the Q&A session. So this is the it for the two presentations for the first session.